Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Uzi Baruch of Protantex, who's going to talk today about monitoring performance from inside the chip. Uzi, as we get further down into more complex chips, as we get into five nanometers, three nanometers, and also into um, much more heterogeneous types of implementations, it's harder to see where we may have potential flaws, right? Yes, yeah, certainly, Ed. Uh, it's uh, quite a challenge, and certainly uh, as the nanotechnology is advancing, uh, that's, that's becoming even a greater issue. Uh, it's uh, even more uh, connected to the fact that we have uh, also uh, later on boards and systems and uh, usage of that with software, and that uh, the combination of it all together uh, is impacting one another in a way uh, that, that, that you sometimes get lost. You also have more analog content. You have more different nodes uh, that are in there. You can't necessarily use the same kind of test on this as well, right? So you can't apply the same kind of heat that you could in, in, uh, in order to test out, will these things survive in the real world? Yeah, certainly. And it's, uh, the test itself is, uh, is complex. The, the fabrication process by itself is creating defects that tests sometimes cannot even, uh, even recognize. Uh, and then later on, when you get uh, when you get a defect back, it's already you know with high cost and, and, and a lot of frustration from all parties that involved with that. So it's certainly becoming becoming a challenge by itself. Let's drill down into this. Sure. Uzi, what are we looking at here? So what we're actually seeing uh, is a holistic solution and, and an overall approach uh, to how we want to solve uh, the, the topic of visibility. Uh, into electronics uh, at all stages. And what you're seeing actually is the introduction of what we call deep data, which is actually having the chip sending telemetry data on its performance and behavior uh, to the outside world. Uh, that certainly can be activated uh, during test when, you, when you're still in manufacturing, but also in mission mode. Data by itself is, is great, uh, but it's also combined uh, with algorithms that they can take advantage and understand what's going on and, and connect all the dots and that is coming out of the data and certainly combining it with other data sources that are uh, important to that. And then it all goes in, into a platform that can analyze and get insights out of it so you can make sense of the data and drive action in the different stages of your manufacturing or usage. What defines deep data versus regular data? So that's an excellent question. Basically, external data or data which is coming from the outside uh, is data that normally is generating by something external that is measuring something on that component and creates a value or a metric out of it, a measurement out of it. Uh, what we're actually talking is for the unit itself, the chip itself, to be able uh, to generate data from, from within. Meaning as it's operating and you're asking him uh, through an interface, a standard interface, what's your performance or what's your status uh, with regard to the different monitors that sits inside, it would actually tell you from within. So is deep data all consistent? Is it all structured exactly the same way or do you have to combine that somehow? It's uh, really different and depends on, the, on what exactly uh, you're measuring. Uh, sometimes the, the kinds of monitors that you place inside are sensitive uh, to process variation. Some, some of it uh, are looking at the clock behavior and how much uh, margin is left uh, uh, between the operating frequency and the actual clock cycle. And so once you have uh, those kinds of, uh, of different metrics, sometimes you need to transform them and understand what they mean and, and how to actually make sense out of them. So it really depends on the different kinds of monitors that you have, uh, that you have inside. One of the challenges here is you have to get the necessary data out of the chip though too, right? And you need to do that sometimes very quickly because you need to understand what's happening inside a chip. And you think about a, a car, for example, that data needs to be almost in real time. Right, that's a, that, that's a great question. So, so first, it really depends on which stage you're at. If you're, if you're in a running car, there's different agents and different monitors. Uh, you just taped out and new silicon is coming and then a high volume manufacturing, whether it's a chip or a system, you have different agents that are looking at different, different areas of the chip. From there, you derive the different actions uh, per that stage. So the first part of it is basically to implant agents and that can look and they're sensitive to different things. So we basically group them into four families uh, of, uh, of agents that then during design, you plan them inside uh, the chip. Some of them are looking at the variation uh, or the they are sensitive to the variation of 
of the process itself. Uh, so they know how to measure uh, the, the actual uh, behavior versus what you expect and derive the expected performance of that uh, specific uh, chip. Some of them are looking at performance, overall performance and uh, degradation of the chip over time. Some of them are relating to interconnection between chip to chip, specifically in, in advanced packaging. And some of them are operational monitoring. And they look, uh, they are mostly used uh, for root cause analysis, what is causing actually the chip to degrade, whether it's, it's different workloads, uh, voltage dro voltages drop or, uh, or, or things which are related to temperature. So those, the, the combination of all of those different kinds of different groups uh, of agents comes into play in different stages. In order to make this work, you have to go almost all the way back to the architectural stage and say, we're going to design this chip to move the data out of the chip and move it around as we need to. But you have different kinds of data, as we mentioned before. How did the different buckets go together? Got those uh, uh, agents uh, were originally designed and the, the intent for them uh, was the, for the purpose of analytics. So the way we designed them, the way we thought about them is that we want to make use of the data. And that, that, that's something which is a fundamental as we're leveraging the data uh, in different stages. So for, first, from an architectural standpoint, there is an open architecture in a way that A, enables you to integrate with the different monitors start, with standard interfaces, certainly through, through the framework in, in different, uh, different stages. And that en enables the controlling unit, whether it's the chip itself, then later on over in a system or even in a car uh, using the car computer to actually ask uh, the chip through standard interfaces, how am I doing? And then all of those different kinds of agents that we, we mentioned earlier would come into play. Uh, they'll do the measurement and grab the data to the outside world and mobilize uh, into, the, uh, into the cloud for, uh, for analytics. A lot of this, though, is, is not just at one stage of a chip, right? So it's not just as it's moving through production or as it's in the design or even as it comes out to the marketplace. Some of these chips have to last for... 15, 20 years, industrial applications, automotive, medical. How do you monitor that and what changes over time? The, the first way to think about it would be uh, basically that you need uh, something to handle uh, that data uh, in the different stages and over its lifetime. So what we've actually done uh, is we've designed, we came with the notion of a platform. The notion of that platform is basically to target first to target applications that would help you in each one of the stages uh, that you're at, whether it's design, new product introduction, volume manufacturing, and in and, and your lifetime operation. And then certainly manage and store the data in a way that would be meaningful uh, for the time that you actually need it. Some companies would use it for seven years or that can be for 20 years. So you need a scalable architecture to manage all of that. And certainly uh, we're not alone in the world. So the idea of uh, te telemetry data can come into play certainly with other kinds of data sources, either test, or infield data, which is coming from different sources, the combination of all of them together alongside with machine learning al algorithms in the different stages is what actually uh, brings the value and the insights um, to the different users at, at, at each stage. Certainly, uh, one, one point to remember with that is that uh, you, know, you, can, you, you can look at the platform as something that you would you know, uh, come at, at, at certain times of the day or, what, or, or whatnot uh, and ask it what's going on. Really, where we're going with that uh, is to drive automated actions uh, and make sure that whatever we're seeing is not only from the analytics standpoint uh, for the purpose of visualization, but also to drive action with different operational systems uh, that we encounter along the different value chains. How do you know that the data you're getting five years down the road is accurate? How do you know that the monitors themselves are working properly versus the chip is failing? We took a different approach uh, when we look at this world of, uh, of manufacturing, certainly uh, through chips and later on in, in electronics. I, I want to maybe give you an analogy uh, of a different world that has made similar, similar change, uh, which is actually the medicine world. You know that uh, when you look at medicine a few years back, you would, you would have seen that basically medicine is target, targeted to wide population. Everyone basically look, is looked at the same, and, you, and if you have a problem, they'll give you a medicine which everyone basically is using. The world has shifted into personalized medicine. And the idea behind it is that they look at you, they analyze you know, the, the, the different measurements from your body, and then they understand that you, Ed, is different than Uzi and different than others. 
and, and whether or not you, you, you have like a similar kind of disease, they'll treat you with something which is more adaptive to your body and maybe your body would rece receive it in a, in a better way. We took the same approach into the chip fabrication world. And we said, look, it's okay to look at a wafer. It's okay to look at a lot and then do path algorithms and NNR and get test data from a tester and try to combine it all together and maybe deduce insights. And look, th th this industry, I know it worked very well for, uh, for quite some time now. Uh, they're using those practices. It's coming you know, from different requirements, sometimes from automotive is more strict. Uh, than other applications and so on. But that's how the industry got used to do uh, its analytics and try to deduce whether you have a problem or not. We've, we've taken a different approach. Our approach basically says, let's look at the chip and what is the expectation uh, from the chip based on, on the variation that we've learned from, from the process uh, and how it behaves, what's the expectation out of it. You can later on compare it to different kinds of population. But the chip itself can tell you, look, I was designed, originated to, to be performing at a certain level of volt, combination of voltage, temperature, and frequency. Now, am I performing that way? Where are my, where are my limits? How am I, do I need to tune myself in order to meet those limits? That's really uh, where we're taking this notion uh, of analytics. And it's quite different than running a test in test mode, getting like an STDF, analyzing what's the wafer means, my, what my, are my neighborhoods, converting it into fat. These kinds of, of, uh, of measurements are trying to uh, imply that if I'm part of a certain population, then certainly I behave like them. But, um, but, but what we're actually seeing is that it's not. Now, when we track it over time, you can actually measure it and see that, that you're actually close to the test itself because we do have that as a reference. That's why we wrote it here as something that is a good reference point. And we can also track that that behavior is consistent over the different stages. This is no longer just a static, we're, we're looking at performance of a chip versus uh, what it's supposed to be at spec. Now it's performance of a chip as it's updated over time. What changes from a reference standpoint? Is it sort of like a digital twin where it now moves as the chip goes through its life, life cycle? It's obvious that the more data points that you have, the more accurate you'll be uh, moving forward. Uh, what's nice about the concept I, I, uh, I just mentioned uh, earlier is that as, it, as each chip uh, has its own behavior and knows the expectation uh, out of it, uh, you can decide at every certain point to have a baseline and measure from that, uh, from that moment. So uh, a second before a car is starting to run and you do your zero kilometers kinds of tests, you can create a baseline. And certainly as, as that moves forward, uh, you can measure degradation, you can measure performance and understand uh, what's going on. Certainly, uh, we encourage uh, companies that are vertical companies to store the entire set of data throughout the life cycle because then you have very good reference points to the initial stages, how the chip behaves, certainly the impact of a system and then the software that comes into it and, and how the usage. But even if that's not, 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 ha not happening, uh, take a zero kilometer, in zero kilometer, you do have the reference of the software, you do have the reference of the system and then the behavior of the chip, that can be a good baseline. Now, next, uh, when you do have an over-the-air update, for example, or the car is running for a certain duration, uh, that initial reference is, is a very strong baseline to compare to the behavior post an update. Um, uh, we encourage uh, companies to test as much as possible before they're shipping the, their uh, product out. But even if you do that, uh, then you'll know two couple of things. One, if the behavior has changed, and certainly the root cause analysis here is a super important feature and capability that you get because if that has an impact on the chip and you get the visibility from within by an over the air, air update of a software, you know if the source is the software update or not. Certainly you can use that as you have more reference points uh, earlier stages to root cause even further backward and find the origin, the, what, where the original problem came from. One of the examples that you can look at for this is that maybe you have a stone that damages the lens on a, a camera that you're using in a car to be able to say, okay, uh, what's, what's this object ahead of us? You know you're getting uh, impaired performance by somehow, but you don't really know what the cause is, right? That, that's, a, that's a really a great question. And, and uh, when you actually look at it, uh, it actually means that you need some kind of tailored analytics uh, for the different stages. So in your example, for that matter, Something has happened. You see, some, some, uh, you see suddenly a degradation in uh, performance. 
Uh, and that's becoming a problem, certainly uh, with the safety kinds of uh, related applications. And so when you look at it, uh, actually uh, there, is, uh, there is the notion of tailoring application to specific needs. The, uh, the idea of uh, either you predict or something has happened and you monitor uh, inside uh, the car. So actually uh, means that you have an application that takes advantage inside the car inside the car computer that actually knows how to look at that uh, specific data. And, uh, and in your example with the, with the camera, suddenly you see that the processing unit does not really understand what's going on with the different images that is coming in, or there's a significant delay uh, for it to analyze, uh, analyze it uh, using, for example, our margin agents, uh, which looks at, at the delay uh, or the delta of uh, the processing that is left for you, you can actually measure if you're actually meeting the target frequency that you originally uh, intended or not, or maybe you overrun it. Now with that, with that, those kinds of applications, uh, you can actually almost immediately alert the car, the system in the car, the, the computer in the car, which most of those uh, new cars are, are connected. Uh, but even if they're not, uh, when you go uh, into a dealership, uh, you can download that data uh, and that would be analyzed in a cloud application. You'll get a phone call saying, look, even if you have not noticed, we know that the, car, that the camera in your car is not performing as expected. Please come, or the safety system, probably that's what you'll hear, is not performing as expected. Please come, we need to check it out. Now, even when that happens, and that's interesting, uh, the, the whole RMA process of what exactly are you seeing and how it's actually being handled from the dealership backward uh, to the different suppliers, whether it's a damaged or maybe something is degraded in the electronics unrelated to a, to a, to a, a stone or whatever, uh, that can be analyzed quite easily uh, because you can see the different metrics. But the whole takeaway here is that you can really localize where the problem is, right? Exactly. Exactly. It can, uh, the different kinds of agents that are inside, that are inside the chip would tell you if this is a, a problem associated with the workload uh, on the chip itself, it can tell you if this is something associated with the processing time uh, or any other kind of issue that is coming out uh, from the behavior of the electronics. And that's what would help you root cause um, uh, the, the, the actual problem itself. Correct. We're starting to see very advanced chips be used in things like automotive. So they're pushing into seven and five nanometers. And we're seeing this also uh, in aerospace. They're starting to become much more complex chips than, than they, what, what they had in the past. A problem that has plagued uh, some of the advanced nodes for some time is latent defects. You can't necessarily see them and it's getting harder at each new node. How does that play into this? What can you do here? Um, the, the problem in general, and I'll touch specifically on latent def defects of not knowing uh, what would happen uh, in the field is a topic that is, that is worrying uh, many companies, certainly in automotive, we see that uh, by having uh, two kinds of, uh, of monitors one of them is the process variation, which is very sensitive uh, to the behavior of the chip. And the second one uh, is a margin agent that actually sits and monitors millions of paths, certainly the critical ones uh, inside the chip. Both of them, the combination of both of them uh, are actually sensitive to those kinds of defects. And, and we'll know if the delay that is being caused uh, inside a certain path is being caused by a defect or not. If you see that red line, what we're actually saying, say, uh, telling to those companies, we can help you predict or even catch earlier, depends on what kind of application we're, we're activating, when would be the car, when, when would the failure itself gonna happen as opposed for it's happening and then you have no clue what's going on. Uzi Baruch, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, it was my pleasure. Thank you.